You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. So I think I've seen, you know, both sides of the street. I've I've sold stocks for a living. I've, I'm an active investor. You know, it's actually encouraged in places like like Cormac and and I've probably visited over 100 mines uh, in my career. And I've, I've looked at them from the lens of a mining company, like how are we gonna mine this and generate return for our shareholders? And I've also looked at them as stocks and, and digits on a screen and what are certain numbers gonna mean to that to that, uh, to that that share price. Thanks for tuning back into Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers, and you're in for a treat today, a new guest that you probably have not heard on any other show. I try to seek out and get recommendations for smart people in this sector that have a depth of experience that can contribute to you and to me as investors in the resource sector. I bring to you today, Tyron, Breitenbach. He's a trained geologist, a seasoned equity analyst, experienced senior partner and managing director of an investment banking group formerly. Currently, he is the SVP of Capital Markets for Eris Mining. So Tyron, thank you for coming on the show for the first time today. Thanks for having me, Bill. You've had some formidable commentators here. So uh, hopefully I don't disappoint your audience. You won't. And okay, so you've worked on the, the sell side, the banking, the geologist, now you're working for an issuer. So can you give a, give my audience a little more of your background? Having worked in all of those things, what did you like the most? And how do you feel like that makes you a well-rounded investor? Yeah, thanks for um, asking the question. So I started my career in South Africa uh, as a mine geologist with Anglo Platinum. I was part of their uh, scholarship program. So in South Africa, we have wonderful geological endowment. There's not a lot of exploration. Uh, it's mostly sort of a mining uh, industry focused on production. So I was really, I was really uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of in charge of managing grade control. So going underground every day, making sure that the ore to waste ratio was right. Um, some of these deposits are very marginal. If you mine uh, wider than 70 centimeters, for example, in Platte Reef, you just don't make any money. So it's just trying to understand the geology and making sure the mine's productive. Uh, I was then lured to Canada and your uh, spicy exploration industry, um, where I started my career uh, in Timmins, Ontario, actually, uh, which is up in the Abitibi, as your viewers likely know. Um, I kicked around with St. Andrew Goldfields for a while before joining Dietra Gold as employee number five. And that was a career highlight. You know, we, we had this old uh, uh, mine that that uh, everyone thought had been mined out and was barren and, and Placer had put on care and maintenance. Um, they actually, sh- actually shut the mine down and, and disassembled the mill. We came in with a new geological model and and, and turned that into into a 20 mil an ounce plus resource. And and I saw a press release uh, last week um, that Agnico is looking to produce 800,000 ounces there. So that was a, a wonderful ride. Um, and when we made this discovery, we needed to uh, transition from an explorer to a developer to a producer. And to do that, you need capital. So we needed to engage the street that starts with the sell side. So I met a lot of investment bankers, research analysts, and uh, got, was very interested in what they do. Um, and likewise, they were interested in a, in a geologist who could catch these companies early and they could lead the financings as, as the companies uh, evolved. So I moved to Cormark as a research analyst. They kind of rolled the dice on me. I was really you know, un- unproven, um, but uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Uh, I was there for 10 years. And, and um, after doing that gig for 10 years, I think it's natural to to uh, want to challenge yourself and, and and get out of your comfort zone again. And and so I transitioned to investment banking um, uh, and they had a good research group. So I could kind of piggyback off that. And and uh, so with that role, I got to see how boardroom works, uh, understand a bit about securities law. Um, so I think I've seen, you know, both sides of the street. I've I've sold stocks for a living. I've, I'm an active investor. You know, it was actually encouraged in places like, like Cormac and and I've probably visited over 100 mines uh, in my career. And I've, I've looked at them from the lens of a mining company, like how are we going to mine this and generate return for our shareholders? And I've also looked at them as stocks and, and digits on a screen and what are certain numbers going to mean to that to that, uh, to that that share price. How are you able to bridge the gap? Because there are so many good geologists that can't make any money in stocks. Can you talk a little bit about how you bridge that gap? That's a great question. And I don't know if it can be learned. Uh, I remember when I was in university, there was a lot of academic concepts, and I was really only interested in where the gold was and and you know how valuable it is and 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 uh, um, so I think I think you know people who have a natural um, interest in the economy 
uh, in in the stock market who happen to become geologists, they kind of you know just sort of fall into this role. Um, you know, time in the seat doesn't hurt. Uh, like I've hired a lot of uh, associates who were not subject matter experts. Like they were just you know business grads. I kind of turned them into subject matter experts. But but you know, watching these companies um, through a sort of microscopic lens year after year, you you start to learn. You start to learn where where the benchmark is, and it's not about the absolute number. It's 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 where is the bar, and are you going to beat the bar or miss the bar? Um, so some of it can be learned, but I think I think just a, just a, you know uh, some of us are just born with a genuine affection for for the stock market. What was your due diligence process like when when you're looking for a new investment? How do you screen for it? Uh, so my every analyst has their own style. Um, you know, some guys were relationship guys; they were just fun to be around. So they would rub shoulders with all of the CEOs, get like a hot piece of information, be the first one to hear about a new discovery. Uh, other guys were forensic financial analysts, and they would just comb through financial statements and and maybe notice, you know, earnings had picked up and 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 uh, some other trigger in in the financial statements that kind of got them interested in the company. Um, as a geologist, I always focused on the asset, right? And I really believe that you know, management teams can change. Capital structures can change, vehicles can change, but what's in the ground is in the ground. Um, so I set up news alerts. So I get basically every press release in the sector, and I, I would I would look for a couple of things. I mean, um, uh, I love a lot of disclosure. So when a company put out a, a detailed cross section, meter by meter uh, assays, uh, when when they were starting to show continuity and the ability to to repeat a drill hole. Right, like it's one thing to to put out a flashy high grade intercept. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a different it's a different matter when when they understand the geometry, uh, 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 the orientation of the ore body, and they can start to bang out intercept after intercept. When you start to see that ability to repeat, you know that's what drives momentum and drives some of these some of these stocks higher. Um, something else I screened for was continuity. Okay, so theoretically. Uh, a hundred gram intercept over a meter has as much value as a one gram intercept over a hundred meters, but the risk profile is much lower on the ladder, right? Like if you have a hundred meter wide zone and you step out fifty meters to drill the next hole, it's a lot less likely that a hundred meter zone is going to disappear than a one meter interval is going to disappear. It's also easier to introduce funny business with a one meter interval. Often, often that one meter interval is the minimum. Sample width, right? Like they're only sampling a meter, uh, a, a piece of core, but the vein itself might be five centimeters, and and you would never know if the issuer didn't include a photograph. So I look for for bulky, simple systems, um, and and if something was high grade and narrow, you kind of had to crank up the level of due diligence. Like you probably have to do a site tour. You definitely want to see some photos of core. Um, so yeah, just screening press releases, looking at cross sections. Um, uh, and doing as many site visits as possible as well. So is it more back of the napkin work or is it like in leapfrog program where you're actually modeling the deposit yourself? You can actually get a lot done with back of the napkin work. Um, and if it's not hanging together and back of the napkin work, then there's no point spending time on on resource estimation software. So at times I had a leapfrog license as a, as a research analyst, but you can get a lot done with just a long section, right? Like try and get every intercept on the the same plane on the same piece of paper, you know, draw a shape around it, measure the area, and figure out figure out the average grade. And and um, you know, some good rules of thumb are um, uh, uh, you want to get meter by meter assays, right? So you you don't want just a big interval. You want to see you want to see how that 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 larger interval is 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 comprised of smaller intervals, and 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 how spiky are the sub intervals. Um, uh, does the does the grade match the style of deposit, right? So if you have a if you have a uh, a porphyry system and you're you're getting you know really spiky spiky gold grades, uh, you know the geology and the assay sheet doesn't add up. Um, so th- th- those are some of the clues to kind of kind of keep an eye out on. You mentioned you went on so many site tours. So if you're not going to see, let's say, a past producer, a big open pit mine where the company's trying to extend mineralization, or you're not going underground to see the ore vein itself, but you're standing on the top of a mountain and management is telling you underneath us is such and such. What key things are you looking for on such a site tour like that? 
Yeah, the head of research would often grind me on this and say, do we really need to pay for you to travel to go and look at a, a swamp up in up in uh, the Abitibi? Uh, but what you get out of those citrus are a couple of things. You know, one, the geologists on the ground, the guys actually logging in the core, you get to spend time with them, right? And often they aren't coached. So they're they're very candid and, and, and they can give you their opinion of the of the ore body. Uh, the core shack is where analysts spend a lot of time. So uh, the management team will lay out the drill hole, you know, hundreds of meters of, of core, and you can actually walk down the hole and you can start to see uh, the alteration and you can see the zone around uh, the actual uh, ore deposit, right? Uh, is, is it visible? Is this something you can distinguish with the human eye? Uh, is it going to be possible to mine underground? Because if your zone is invisible, that's a lot of sampling and it means you're going to have challenges when you're trying to do grade control um, underground. Uh, you know, often these manager teams would actually print off the assay sheet. So you're, you're walking along the core and you can, you can kind of compare, uh, the, the, the rock to the, to the, to the, um, uh, assay sheet, right? Um, so you can, you can sort of eliminate, you know, basic, basic funny business. Uh, uh, you can find out whether they're orienting the core, right? Uh, uh, are they drilling down the throat of a deposit or are they actually cutting it at 90 degrees? These are the kind of things you can pick up pick up on uh, the site tour. Um, and then other sort of anecdotal things are, is, is the core shack neat? Do they have a good process? Um, are the staff excited to be there? Um, uh, uh, is everything organized and well run? You know, these are these are little clues as to as to corporate governance and the the, the general culture uh, of, of of the firm. And then and then there's 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 always a lot of chatter in in these towns, right? So so often often the geos at at Great Bear know what's going on in evolution uh, down down the the, uh, the road. And often the the unsung heroes in any in any company in any success story is not is not the CEO and the CFO and the COO. It's kind of one or two levels below that, um, and there are some really, you know, intelligent, inspiring people at these at these operations. So uh, always, always great meeting them on these on these side tours. So you uh, you are geologically trained, so and you have the privilege to be on site. Most of my listeners are not geologists, and they won't be able to be on site for these companies they might invest in. So what key signs should they look for for a bullish sign for a company? So for example, I've been told in the past that. The most bullish, easy thing for a retail investor to identify uh, in a junior mining stock is if you see the CFO buying stock in the open market because he is the most pessimistic person usually at the at the company. Would you agree with that? And what might be some other tips you could give? I really like that. I love man management insider buying. It is so rare in our sector. Although I'm going to give a plug for Aeros Gold or Aeros Mining, where, where I work at right now. I mean, we own six percent of our own company. Um, so lately I've been watching Dave Lotan over at Orion just scooping up stock, right? Um, so that's, that's a really bullish, not be a signal. And, um, one of my clients, uh, US Global, they, they would, would own both producers and explorers. And he had a, uh, he had a, a, a matrix on how he picked stocks. And one of them was, was management quality, right? And so for the producers, he would look at, stability of earnings, how often they hit guidance, how accurate their guidance was. And for the juniors, all he looked at was was insider ownership. Um, and he's been one of the best performers for a couple of decades now. So it's, it's a pretty reliable uh, metric. Uh, something else I look for is disclosure. Okay, if you open up a press release and someone is claiming to have this great new discovery and there's a headline, no meter by meter assays, no section, no photos of the core, like that's a red flag. Like if you have something special, you're you're dying to communicate it to the world, and I I don't know if I should be talking about specific stocks or, or whether you you allow that. Um, but I've recently been looking at Max Resources in Colombia. So we're in Colombia, so I'm monitoring you know other stuff going on in the country. Um, and you know the stock hit 80 cents earlier this year. It's back down to like the mid 30s. Uh, uh, there's a lot of buzz on the street about this new copper sedimentary belt they found uh, could be a game changer in the industry. And if you go and look at their presentation, their website. It's incredible the disclosure that they're giving. Like they have a drone that start because th there's no drill hole at this project. It's only surface channels right now, which is a very high risk proposition, right? Uh, like pre drill bed story. Um, so they have this drone that hovers over the first channel, uh, and it's like several meters of five percent copper. It flies 100 meters up the hillside. They have another channel, kind of identical assays. Then it flows over the hill, and I think there's a lot of tools these days, you know, on the web to give retail investors who can't actually 
go on a guided tour with management, um, a lot of disclosure. Um, uh, uh, something else I would recommend is every year at the PDAC, they have the core shack where, where the technical group, you know, come and present the core. Uh, and that's a, that's, that's a really good chance to, to actually look at the, look at the drill hole. But, um, yeah, if you're, if you're struggling with disclosure, that in itself is a red flag, you know, management buying is a good, a good, uh, analog. And then, and then the final thing I'll say is a, um, a change in the tempo and caliber of assays. Uh, so there was a, a little company maybe five or six years ago called Integra Resources. And they had an okay asset, but it was, it was skinny. You know, grade was mediocre. And then all of a sudden something changed and, and the widths were improving. Um, um, it, it was just a t- different tenor of ore body. And so when that happened, I actually requested a site tour. Um, and, and I was able to sit down with the geologist. And what happened was they had a new model. They found a new vein set but because of the way they were drilling. The, 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 uh, the drill core was just clipping the vein at a, at a weird angle. And just by turning the rig around, they were actually able to understand this new geometry, look at it in a different light. And that kicked off a lot of growth. And they were eventually acquired by Eldorado and Sigma Lamac is probably the most valuable asset inside Eldorado right now. So, so if, if a company that's, that's, that's usually putting out, let's say 10 grams over a meter and has been doing that for years. And all of a sudden they're, they're drilling two grams over a hundred meters. Like, like then it's, then it's worth perking up, digging in. Uh, and I think retail investors will be surprised how accessible some management teams are. Like in this market, uh, guys are picking up the phone. Uh, I think manager teams are willing to talk to anyone who would, who would, who would listen. What do you think about neurology plays? Newfoundland, we saw that the last couple of years. Like, what's some advice for how an investor should go about a neurology play? Yeah, I actually like the neurology play. Uh, it can be a value trap at times. Um, so you really need to understand the play. Not a promotional trap. Some would say it's a promotional trap. There is. There's always a promotional trap. So, so, so being a neurology play means I care a bit more, but I still need to do the due diligence. But the bar is lower for what you have to find to be acquired. So one of the best picks in my career was a company called Battle North. Okay, they were up in Red Lake, um, and uh, this was right around the time that Great Bear, you know, had made it clear to the market that they had discovered a a super super pet. Uh, uh, Evolution had acquired the the Red Lake mine from from uh, Newmont, um, so that the the camp was going through a bit of a resurgence. But but Battle North was a rebranded Rubicon, uh, which almost went into bankruptcy because they they tried to mine a narrow vein, nuggety gold deposit on too few drill holes and a and a PA instead of a bankable feasibility study. Um, but it got to the point where where there was so much milling capacity and so much overhead at at Newmont at Evolution. That if you could give them, if you could give them infrastructure and resources in their backyard, they almost had to buy it, right? Uh, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's understanding the needs of the incumbent. So in Finland, you know, the first thing I do is like, look at Agnico. Like how much ore reserves do they have left? How big is their mill? If there's excess capacity, if Agnico's mill is full, if they, if they're mining really high grade and the grades are going up, they're not going to do anything stupid. They're not going to overpay for, for an asset. But as, as that, as that piece of infrastructure and the resource attached to it gets to the end of its mine life, you know, they, they are likely to, to be chasing, uh, nearby players and don't, and don't forget the infrastructure play. So at Detour, we acquired a company called Tradewinds and we hated their ore body. Their ore body was, was terrible. I, I don't think it would have ever turned into, in, into, into a mine, but we couldn't put, uh, a certain infrastructure. I, I can't remember if it was tailings. Or, or maybe the camp, but we just needed the ground. So it, the, the ground. So it ends up becoming a real estate play. Um, uh, and so one of the reasons I like Orion right now is they've got this joint venture with B2. Okay. And, and Rupert has made it just a phenomenal discovery. Like kudos to their team. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if some of the infrastructure there is going to spill over onto, onto that, uh, onto that JV ground. Um, so yeah, I think, I think closeology more than anything sort of lowers the bar. But be careful. Um, you know, these are sophisticated companies and they're not going to do anyone any, any favors just because they're close by. Tyron, what I'm hearing you say, and correct me if I'm wrong, a company with an asset or some type of assets that a producer would want. That, that's one type of closeology here. But I guess I had more in mind when I was asking the question, 
exploration okay. plays. You get a hot discovery. There's not a big producer in the area, but you get a lot of exploration plays that pop up and get an 80 to $120 million market cap based on speculation. Uh, in that scenario, what would you advise? Okay. Uh, thanks for clarifying the question. I think that's, that could be a value trap. I mean, a good example of that is... Uh, in southern Mali, right? B2 found Focola or bought, bought Focola and, and it shone the light on this part of Africa that was probably underexplored. And, and, you know, Ross Camp came in, a um, couple of Aussie players. And at one point in time, they all had a hundred million market cap because it was a, it was a hot new belt. Uh, very few of them have survived. I think, you know, Ross Camp's still doing, still doing a great job and, and has a, and it's probably has found a mine. Um, but yeah, I, I'd be very careful of buying stock. Just because it's close to where someone else made a made a discovery, uh, there's probably a lot of hot air in the stock. So I think you need an incumbent, someone with a mull, someone with overhead, and 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 an exit strategy. Um, otherwise, that, that that could be a scary situation. Tyron, do you have any rules of thumbs for investors for that that first hump or that first hill of the Lasan curve when there's the discovery and there's a, the excitement before they go into full delineation and development mode? So, for example, I've been told by an analyst on the show before, make sure that I sell before the market cap reaches 20% of the gross metal value in the ground. And I bumped that off a couple CEOs and they said, hey, Bill, that's that's pretty accurate. I, that's a good rule of thumb. Are there any other rule of thumbs that you have for that first kind of incline of the Lausanne curve for investors? That's a great question. I mean, I had one client who would say, I sell everything when it gets to a $500 million market cap. Because what happens is you now are targeting a different kind of investor. Okay. You're probably dealing with a, with a, a long only institution that needs a resource and a PA. Like they can't buy, uh, uh, uh pre, pre resource companies, even if it is a wonderful discovery. So this but you would have missed out on Great Bear, right? I, I would have absolutely missed out on Great yeah. Bear. Well, those, those investors would have missed out on Great Bear. And yeah. so shout out to, to 1832, who, who, you know, was, was, was able to kind of, Kind of go against um, sort of popular wisdom uh, and and pull off a fantastic trade in 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 a bear market. Um, something that that I look at is really just pace of news flow, right? I almost like if if a stock's in the the rising you know first part of the the sexiest part of the Lasan curve is do they have enough capital to pump out results? Okay, uh, have they found the limits of the ore body? If they can keep the news going, you got to stay with the stock. Like usually these things dip as the news peters off and the market is like a bit of a drug addict, right? Like, like the, the holes need to get wider, higher grade. Um, um, so, so with a story like Great Bear, you know, you almost needed to watch every presentation Chris Taylor gave because, because as they were understanding the ore body, the holes were getting better and better. And, and, you know, there's sort of waves of, 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 uh, drilling, right? When, when they're in a good zone, right? That's the time to own the stock. So. I'd be less worried about the valuation and more focused on the pace of the catalyst. And there's a seasonality to a lot of these explorers. If you're in BC, uh, often you can't drill during the winter, or it takes longer to get assays, especially now that assay labs are 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 are, are, are backed up. So I think it's a pace of catalyst thing rather than a than a valuation thing. And for that peak market cap, if it's a half a billion dollars, would you, if it, they were exploring for a copper gold porphyry, which could be worth billions of dollars, would you raise that market cap perhaps for the type of the deposit? I, I would raise it not because the ore body is more valuable, but because the geological risk is lower. Okay. So with a porphyry, you know, you're putting out kilometer long intervals, right? Uh, the grade is pretty stable meter to meter. So those are the easiest ore bodies to estimate. Like like some of these copper porphyries, you can stick three holes into and have a pretty good idea of how big the resource is, right? But when you're dealing with a one or two meter wide gold zone, that's that's a lot of drilling. So at Detour Gold, we, we drilled a million meters to put out our first big resource. It just needs more drilling. Um, so yeah, you can you, you you can probably go higher with with sort of a copper porphyry uh, style of deposit. And then and then the, the other thing is the, is the balance sheet, right? So if the stock's ripping. And they're down to three million bucks in cash. Like, don't dive in front of an equity fund. It's like, like I think that's when that's when you need to pause, let the market fund the thing, you know, pick up the momentum, and then and then buy it again. So you're always going to be watching. You're always going to be watching the balance sheet of these guys, and 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 it can decline quickly, right? Like if you're if you're two and a half months into the quarter, the presentation probably has the last financial statement cash number, and they might have blown through it. Um, so kind of knowing knowing when they're going to hit. The tape for an equity offering uh, that, that can suck a lot of energy out of out of these stories at that point in the
you pay attention to the shorts when you're in a junior minor, how the, the short action in a stock? Not so much the junior miners because they're just not that liquid. So they tend not to attract the shorts more. But they can be manipulated down, I think, by institutions who want to accumulate. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, I mean, if you're, if, if they even smell a financing, right, they are, they are maybe not outright shorting it, but buying it and selling it down. And then, you know, you know, they're crushing your stock with the left hand, the right hand, they're offering you a juicy financing with a bunch of warrants. That's like Canadian capital markets 101. Like the market ecosystem thrives off of that, right? Um, uh, so that's up to the management team to kind of try and outsmart the more predatory investors. Like not all investors operate that way, but they're a large contingent of them, of them do. So you need to be aware of that, of that, uh, uh, dynamic. And I mean, I, I don't want to name the stock. We've just seen an example in our space right now, right? Where, where a lot of the upside was just wiped out with a, with a big dilutive raise. Um, what type of raises do you like? Rights offering in this type of market? No, there's nothing wrong with raising equity and, and, and you should raise equity. And when investors are banging down your door to offer you equity, that's the time to take it because you've got the best, the best negotiating power. I think who you take the money from is most important. So if Rob Cohen believes in your discovery, okay, and is trying to give you five million bucks, you, you better take it um, because, because he's going to be there till the end. Uh, uh, you know, he's sophisticated, um, uh, long only, um, and it's almost a validation of your of your project, right? So, so take money from people who are aligned with you, and and don't sweat the price, right? I mean, I mean, don't give away silly warrants or a big discount. But if but if the if the clearing price lately is a is a eight percent discount uh, or or a unit deal with with a half warrant, then you know uh, investors have to make money as well. So I think I think I think it's a bit of a balancing act. Um, and that's where the brokers come in, right? That, that, that's where the sell side plays a valuable role is they find the clearing price. Like often, often companies, you know, want to price their deal at, at maximum 100% value, right? Uh, uh, and they end up attracting the wrong shareholders or not getting the deal off. I think the brokers play a good role in terms of, you know, finding that, that clearing price where, where it's uh, the best result for all parties involved. Can my listeners trust the sell side information that's put out there? Research reports such as you used to produce for, for your former employer? Yeah, so the research spectrum is all over the place, right? You get uh, some research analysts are just, uh, are just mouthpieces for the investment bankers, okay? Uh, they tend to not stick around long because if your clients, your investor clients aren't making money, then you're not going to make money long-term as an investor. I think it's important to just understand the inherent conflict of interest, right? Like they are selling something. And and there are two kinds of pitches from research analysts, more, more from a sales desk, really. It's uh, there's the product they are told to sell because it's what their investment bankers have on the desk right now. And then there's there's the other product where, yeah, they're going to make some money off the trade or off the deal, but they really, really like it, right? And, and investment banks should be compensated. They take a lot of risk. They, they play an important role in the ecosystem, but you can usually tell what sort of pitch you're getting. Um, and this is why this is why conversations are, are important, right? Because you have to be careful what you put in writing as a research analyst. Because if I'm a research analyst uh, covering 20 companies, I need to be able to contact the management team. I need to be able to go on these site tours. If I if I have a bunch of nasty research out there, I'm not going to get invited, right? And so research analysts often get lambasted for softball questions on conference calls. And it's like, that's their job. They are supposed to you know, play both sides and and help investors navigate the market, but also have access to 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 management team. And then and then something else I find interesting is is retail looks at a target price and they they give it so much weight, but I can tell the institutions don't care about the target price. The, the target price is a is a direction, right? So when I had a lot of conviction about an idea, I would put on a crazy target price, like it'd be a two dollar stock, and I'd go ten dollars. And and I knew the phone would ring, right? Because it's like, like, are you nuts? It's like, yeah, it's probably not going to 10 bucks, but it's definitely going to six bucks, right? And so it's directionality. You and aren't concerned about your reputation? Because I've been told the analysts, you stair-step your target prices up, right? Like once you prove your thesis a little, you have more confidence to raise it. You know, if it's a well-covered name, you do that. But if, you, if, you're, if you're trying to get attention and if you have conviction, you better have conviction, right? And I think if I put a $10 target on a $2 stock and it goes to six bucks, and my investor you board still look good. Like, you know, uh, that's a great outcome for, for everyone. And then, and then something else, I, like one investor told me, I called the guy with the highest target and the lowest target, right? And, and nobody needs a consensus hugger, right? Like, like the other thing to remember about the sell side is 
they get paid for being interesting and having an opinion, right? And to have an opinion, you're going to be wrong. Like you need to be right 70% of the time. Like you'll be a great analyst if you're right 70% of the time. But if you have the same market view as anyone else, I would never call you. You have no value to me, right? Um, so a lot of young analysts make the mistake of just never wanting to be wrong. And I think you won't make a good analyst. Uh, and these investors listen to analysts, but not like these investors are sophisticated. They're not going to call one guy and do what he says. It's just one opinion. They appreciate the opinion. It's just one one data point that they mix with all of their all of their other uh, data points before they make their their decision. What are some key mistakes that you've seen professional investors make? You've mentioned some of them, but any more you could share? Yeah, there's uh, two more uh, I would share. Uh, the first one is um, people on the sell side can be very charming, okay, and and sometimes investors uh, end up doing things because they like spending time with someone, right? Uh, and I think I think if someone's managing my money. Uh, I want their eye on the ball. Like I don't want them. I don't want them rubbing shoulders with a guy because he, you know, makes you feel good. Um, uh, the second thing is, is we all have history, and I fall into this trap as well, right? Where, where you've had a bad trade, you've been burnt by an ore body, and then you won't see the next one coming. Like I, I missed Great Bear, right? I did not like it when I first met the company, uh, and I eventually came came around. But I just seen so many Red Lake discoveries fizzle. Because there's a saying that you know you can throw a rock in the woods in Red Lake and hit a high-grade gold vein. It doesn't mean it's going to be a mine, right? And so, so I think a lot of investors, you know, you'd show them something, and they would have had a similar experience, or they they owned the company in a prior iteration, and they wouldn't touch it. I think a good example is Rubicon and Battle North, right? Like, like if you got wiped out on on on, on Rubicon, it's tough to go back to Battle North. But, but I understand that, right? Because because you know um, uh, some of these mental humps are just too big to 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 get over, uh, but I always admired the investors who could pivot when the story changed um, and just be very very open minded. When it comes to technical reports, I remember investing in a developer, and I downloaded the four hundred page PDF of their pre feasibility study, and I said, "Am I sure I'm going to invest in these companies? I have no idea what this is even saying." Like for a retail investor, they get one of these technical reports. What are the key things to look for? Yeah, so a couple of things I would zoom right into is just go to the search bar on the PDF and type CV, which stands for coefficient of variation. And it just tells you how nuggety the ore body is, right? Uh, so if you have a CV of 20, it's an insanely nuggety ore body, uh, and they better be capping it very aggressively. Um, another thing I would look at is the resource table. They often show it at different cutoff grades. So if a manage if a if a project has let's say a, a resource grade of eight grams, but they're using a two gram cutoff, okay, what happens when you move the cutoff to four grams? Do you lose a bunch of gold, right? Or does the grade go up, but the same you have fewer tons and the same amount of gold? So so looking at the deposit through various cutoff grades tells you how resilient it's going to be. And if they only show you the resource of one cutoff grade, that's a problem. Uh, you also want as much blue sky between the, the resource grade and the cutoff grade as possible. So if you have a, a two gram deposit and a 1.5 gram cutoff grade, right, for an underground mine, like that's a problem, right? If, if your mining costs are wrong, the deposit doesn't, doesn't work. So, so cutoff grades, CV, and then capping, like, like Google capping or search capping, and then see, do they cap the deposit? And if they don't, uh, and when I say cap the deposit, I mean, I mean, gold is inherently um, geostatistically difficult. You have outliers in the population and you are supposed to remove them. And it's difficult because sometimes all the gold is in, is in the outliers. So not capping a deposit is not the end of the world, but but just you know read the section where they talk about capping and why they're not capping it, right? So for example, Pretium didn't cap their grade because 90% of the gold was in was in an outlier. Um, um, but, but it's worth reading that that section. And then and then at the end of the report, there's usually a, a section called uh, validation, and what they'll do is they'll they'll run a bunch of plots and just and just show how their estimate is holding up. So they've they've done the estimate, they've counted how much gold is in the ground, and then, then they give you some examples. and And one of the things they do is is show you a cross section of the raw drill hole and the blocks. And if the drill hole is is you know green with no grade, and the blocks behind it are bright red, you've got a problem. Right, uh, uh, but but if the if the raw data is overall matching the block model, then it means their recipe for calculating 
gold grades is generally matching uh, uh, nature. Uh, so those, those are some of the things that I would, I would whisper. That's excellent advice. What about a pre-resource explorer? How do you value this? Is it, is it more um, intuitive? I mean, you're, you're just taking your experience and you're filtering everything through your experience when it comes to valuing an explorer? Yeah, I think intuition is a big one. I think, I think, as you mentioned, catalysts are important. So if I think a stock is responding to drill results, the company is in a financial position to continue to fund drilling and the deposit is open and we're going to see results like this every two weeks for two months, you just buy the stock. Like valuation doesn't matter. It's just momentum. After a while, you know, when a company's been drilling for two or three years and Great Bear kind of got to that point before they were taken out is, is you start to take a stab at estimating the resource. So, so if you if you do your own math on a piece of paper and and these companies generally put out great data and you do a little polygonal estimate and you think there's 2 million ounces and the average company trades at $50 an ounce and and the market's only pricing in a million ounces and that's probably probably a good buy. Um uh but in, but in the early days, you know, you can't even take a stab at resources. It's more just about momentum. Um and then I think the move from sort of 20 million market cap to 100 million market cap is always the easiest. You know, the 100 to 200 is 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 tougher because 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 you're you're just having to bring in a different quality of investor and the risk proposition uh has has changed. Would you share a little bit about where you're investing your money? Yeah, so I'm a big shareholder in the company I work for, uh Eris Mining and what I like about Eris is is we are a producer right now. We're going to generate 260,000 ounces of gold this year. Uh, but we have 25 million ounces of resources. So we do not need to take expiration risk. We're at the bottom end of the comp table in terms of PNAV, and we have $600 million in funding. So our capital structure won't change. We'll have the same shares outstanding two years from now. So if there's a gold window, we're going to hit it. And I think we're a very inexpensive stock and and uh, our board and, and, and manager team is fantastic. Uh, I mean, Ian, Ian, Ian Telfer is our chair. Neil Woodger is our CEO. These guys are serially successful. Um, so I, that's my big producer bet. Uh, I, I've been buying Max resources. Um, you know, I'd love the disclosure. Uh, uh, I think permitting a big copper project in Colombia might have some challenges, but, but I think it doesn't matter. Like if you're pumping out big drill results, the stock's going to go up. Uh, I've been buying Orion. Um, I know the company well, covered it as a research analyst. I love the geology of Finland. Uh, when I see Dave Lotan scooping up every share he can get, you know, uh, that makes me feel good about, about buying some stock. Um, and then I think uh, on the developer side, it's been tough because if you have a good project, like not, an, not, a, not a discovery story, but a project story, in this market where capital is anemic, you can have a great project and just blow it up by doing a bad deal. And one of the few developers I'm buying is uh, Asino. Um, and we discussed this a little bit before the call. I think that because you were an analyst for Osino, we should point out, right? You yeah, write I, them I up. Analyst, I, was, I was analyst for Osino, and, and also there are an army of 100,000 ounce a year projects. Once you get to 150, 200,000 ounces, it's it's tougher. So the scarcity factor is there with Osino. I like Namibia. You know, there's a huge currency benefit there. Like if you look at the gold price in South African rands or or Namibian dollars, it's probably making all time highs. Um, you know, low strip ratio, it's kind of idiot proof, uh, and they have enough cash and they have, they have guys like Ross Beatty in the capital structure. So let's say markets are really switched off. They can, they can always survive, right? So I, I know that, you know, there's not going to be 500 million shares outstanding, uh, by the time the company gets, gets, gets acquired. So that's where I'm investing. And then, and then lately I've actually, you know, committed the cardinal sin and I've stepped outside of mining, uh, uh and I've tried to buy, uh, you know, some of these tech stocks, like you look at a company like Adobe, you know, which has a huge moat that's being dragged down with all these other tech stocks. So just yeah, I send them money every month, Adobe. Well, that's the thing, right? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's tough to get away from that business. And and then I think Rio Tinto uh, on the base metal side pays an 11% dividend. Mm. Uh, and, and, and if our biggest concern is inflation, you know, price of copper, iron ore, uh, you know, those commodities have to go higher as well. Um, so you like Rio Tinto over a BHP or a Vale? Probably because I know it the best. Uh, I think all three would be would be solid. Uh, I think Rio is also ahead of the curve on the battery metal trend. Um, and they have some assets here in Canada. So I actually just haven't looked at the other two closely. I just, 
someone flagged that they were paying 11% dividend, uh, dug in a bit to their commodity mix and and just, just seemed like a good sort of counter, counter cyclical bet. Tyron, best way for listeners to follow you online? So I'm on Twitter at uh, Tyron's Gold. Uh, I would suggest guys and girls sign up for uh, Eris Mining uh, updates as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just uh, happy to connect with your audience uh, anytime whatsoever. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I know I'm following some big footsteps here. Thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks. Thanks.